Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. We're starting a new series of lessons today, a series based on the two books, the two little books, First and Second Thessalonians. These are probably the earliest books that Paul wrote and probably the earliest books written in the New Testament. So uh, we'll start off with some historical background, but before we do that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all that Paul did. And we think about his friends, Luke and others, who wrote most of the New Testament for us. We ask now as we open up these two small books and, and consider the historical background in the book of Acts, that we may be able to discern better than before the truths that you want us to understand is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you know a little bit about Paul's second missionary journey, his travel from his home church located in Antioch in the country of Syria, or what we would call Syria today, uh, and he traveled up through Pisidia and over to Cyprus and then up to Pisidia and, and off across to the uh, central part of what we would call Turkey today, and finally up to Troas where he probably met, well almost certainly met Dr. Luke and then Dr. Luke joined them and he received that vision calling him to go over into Macedonia. So, and then he ended up of course down in Corinth. So we're going to talk a little bit about the historical details and immediately connected with this mission of Paul and Silas uh, and what happened to them just before and just after their visit to Thessalonica and how that might have impacted the message that, uh, they, that Paul wrote in these two short letters. <clears throat> it's interesting that in these very early, remember we're talking about the early books, the earliest probably books in the New Testament, what we would call the New Testament, and it still says in, um, in some translations, not every translation is the same, but um, let me just pick this one. Um, Anyway, it says, and let me just back over here since I'm not seem to be coming up with what I wanted here. First Thessalonians 2.13. Let's see if we can find that here because I want to read it to you right out of the original. Would you dare to say these words if you were just starting to write a letter to friends? For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Paul must have felt fairly confident about what he had to say. You know, here he's writing a letter to his friends. Thessalonica says, I want you to know the words I'm writing here are the word of God. How does that, does that seem a little arrogant to you? This was his second missionary journey. This was his second missionary journey, but his first book. And he had already spent three years or so getting well, no. up to speed after being blinded, or is this? Oh yes, this is a uh, good, good question. Um, if, we can, if we can try to reconstruct the historical background a little bit, uh, Jesus was crucified in the spring of AD 31. Stephen was stoned three and a half years later, and the Christian persecution began severely in Jerusalem, and the Christians scattered in AD 35. Uh, I'm sorry, AD 34, the fall of AD 34. And AD 35 was almost certainly the time when Paul was uh, struck with blindness on his road to Damascus after he'd been persecuting the church for about a year. And then um, he went, to, of course, to Damascus. He preached in Damascus. Then he went out, according to Galatians, he went out into the Arabian Desert for three years, came back. Now he would be somewhere around AD 38 or 39. Came back, preached some more in Damascus, went down to Jerusalem, we spent a couple weeks there, was warned of God, you have to get out of here, they'll kill you. He left and went back to his home in uh, his original family home in Tarsus. Um, and as far as we know, he stayed there until Barnabas came and called him somewhere around probably 46 or 47 A.D. 
and the two of them went back to Antioch where they were instrumental in helping to build up the church there. After they'd been there for a year or two, the people at Antioch placed their hands on them, blessed them, and sent them off on their first missionary journey, which they went up as far as the central part of, of Turkey. Uh, and they were stoned, Paul was stoned, etc. if you remember, and finally came back, back to Antioch, spent another year or so there, came back and said, let's go back and visit the churches that we had visited before, and then let's, well, it was Paul's plan to either travel further north or possibly go over by the coast and travel south, remaining in Asia Minor. But as we will discover as we read these books uh, in the context back in Acts 16 and 17, he was prevented by the Holy Spirit from going there. So he, then he received a vision in the night saying, come over to Macedonia. And so for the first time, one of the apostles, if you will, actually entered Europe and began uh, evangelizing there. So he's got at least 15 years under his belt now. Yes. In, in this ministry. And we get the, most of this information from Acts? Yes. Okay, so do we know in Acts whether he had any of the visions or was this yeah. the first time? Oh yeah. Uh, okay, we, so this so is the first time we know he's had a vision or a... Uh, uh, the first time we know, th um, that's a good question. Yes, I believe so. He had one on the Damascus Road. Well, if you call well, it a vision, yeah. Yeah, after that. Yeah. Well, okay. I, just putting it all and trying to get it in an area where yes, I can understand. of course. So, don't you think that a person could be able to tell whether it, a an idea had come from within yourself or from God? Right. Would there be a, no. something different there? But how many people uh, have you heard of, even on television today, who tell you that they're receiving messages from God? Do you believe them? And to be that confident and say, this is the Word of God. Well, it, it, he's kind of talking about things in past tense here, isn't he? Yeah. Because it, it's word that came to them before from him. So there's probably some time to check out the word and to, yeah, to but not see, if it rings, see if it rings or not. These, sure. letters, these are, letters are written probably no more than a few weeks after he had been in Thessalonica. The first one and then the next one probably two or three weeks after that. Very soon after he left Thessalonica. Do you think there was some sort of display of the Spirit when he, when he told? Well, I'm asking stuff? you, what, how would you, what Why would it take for you? Why now did he start writing? What, what? Yeah, good question. There's well, reason. yeah. I'm sure there is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's look at the story. Remember, he, he, we talked about this. He got as far as his western part of, of Asia Minor, or Turkey as we would call it today. He wanted to go south, he wanted to go north, and he was prevented. He spent a little time in Troas. What does he was prevented mean? Well, that's a good question. Um, Do I dare ask that? <laughs> we're going to... Well, I don't know, maybe this is a good time to go and look at that. Um, go to, I will take you to my, my Good News translation, and we'll go over to Acts 16. Actually, it's Acts 17. I'm sorry, it is 16. We'll drop back to 16. Um, okay. Um, yeah, they traveled to the region, I'm sorry, it would be 16, um, yeah, starting with verse 6. They traveled to the region of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit did not let them preach the message in the province of Asia. That would be to the south. When they reached the border of Mycia, that's north, they tried to go into the province of Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So what's going on there? That night Paul had a, I'm sorry, so they traveled right on to Mycenae and went to Troas. That night Paul had a vision in which he saw a Macedonian standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. As soon as Paul had this vision, we got ready to leave for Macedonia because we decided that God had called us to preach the good news to the people there. So, um, Macedonia is Greece. Macedonia would be, Europe. yeah, it would be, it would be, they crossed over the Bosporus and into Europe. Hellespont, yeah. So he was prevented. Prevented, what does that mean? The Holy Spirit would not let him go. So what happened to the Holy Spirit? Well, well those of us, 
those of us who are of European extraction ought to be really thankful because this led to the massive spread of Christianity and basically became the dominant religion in, in Europe. He could have gone to Africa, he could have gone to Russia, he could have gone, you know, Yeah, but what east. actually prevented him? That's my question. That was my question. <laughs> Well, it's my I told question. You. Here, the answer is I tell you. <laughs> the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus, it says. And that could have the been Spirit. any different number. And we're going to find out that the Holy Spirit is doing other things like this when he, later on in our story. So it could be anything from a providential thing, like, like they were going on this trail, a tree fell across, they had to go around the tree, but then they ended up, oh, let's go this way anyway, and they ended up going this way. Yeah. Could be anything. There's no evidence that God said, go specifically to this city, so. Maybe they missed the caravan that was going. That's right. Into the yeah. various places, missed the train today. No, I don't, don't think there was they, any train. Uh, no trains. Maybe the maybe weather they was bad. The train. Maybe the weather was bad that day, going well, this direction, so they decided to go this direction. What happened was they, 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 they landed on the coast, probably traveled by, well, they had to travel some, cover across some part of ocean, um, landed on the coast, went immediately to the first big city, Philippi. And uh, Philippi, where does it get its name, just to give you a little historical background? Philip of Macedon. It was named after Alexander the Great's father, right? And Philippi, as we hopefully no, it was a Roman colony, mean, meant that it was ruled according to Roman rules and it followed the customs of Rome and they spoke the Roman language and followed Roman law, etc. It was, it was a Roman colony there. After casting out the demon, you remember Paul had been there for a few weeks and he cast the demon out of that young woman and who was supposed to be able to tell the future by her, her uh, to her spirit that she had in her. And so when Paul cast that evil spirit out of her, what happened? Well, her owners, her I would say manipulators lost their means of, of income and they, ra they roused up a whole crowd and beat Paul and Barnabas up, and, I mean Paul and Silas up and ended up getting them thrown in prison and after having been beaten Paul and Silas probably were, were almost crucified in a, on a rock it's at a 45 degree angle with their hands and their feet uh, bound either to big logs or something so they couldn't move basically. So, I mean, you can't sleep, they've been beaten, so they're singing. And what happened? Big earthquake. Big earthquake, and the prison was opened, and remember the jailer was ready to kill himself, and Paul says, don't, 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 we're all Why here. Was the jailer ready to kill himself? Well, that's a good question. Uh, some people would suggest when he said, what must I do to be saved, he might have been saying, what must I do to be safe? Um, I know, good question. He was, he was afraid, afraid that if, the prisoner, if any of the prisoners escaped, he would be held responsible. And in those days, it meant if you, the prisoner escaped, your head would be cut off. So that's what he was really afraid of. But he took, him, he took them to his house, bandaged up their wounds, listened to the gospel. He and his family were converted. The next morning, what happened? Remember? He baptized the whole family. He, well, sometime during the night or in the morning, he baptized the family. And then all the city leaders came out to say, well, no, they sent a message first saying, Paul and, Barnab uh, Paul and Silas, keep wanting to say Barnabas, Paul and Silas, please leave. And Paul and Silas said, nothing doing. We're Roman citizens. You're going to beat us and you're going to throw us in jail and you're going to just now tell us to leave. You can come and escort us out of the city yourselves if that's the way you feel. And boy, let me tell you, they did. When they found out that they were Roman citizens, they <laughs> hightailed up there real quick. So why did Paul insist that the, the city leaders come and escort them out of the city instead of just leaving? Good question. Almost certainly because he wanted them to know that this upstart religion wasn't some freaky, you know, underhanded, secret, something or rather else. It was led by some Roman citizens who had thought through seriously these issues and it, was, it, was, it wasn't to be just put down as if it belonged to a, to, a, to a nobody group. So they didn't know Paul in this area? No. So they didn't First know anything Paul about him so he was kind of making himself, making a name for himself. Yes. Very clearly. So it's kind of interesting when they grabbed him in the first place, why didn't he say, hey, I'm a Roman citizen? He probably didn't have a chance. They came after quick? 
Yeah, they came after him to beat him and, and so forth like this and put him in prison. They were shouting and carrying on. So anyway, when he left Philippi, what did he do? He traveled through a couple smaller towns and on to Thessalonica, which of course is our main study for this quarter. What happened in Thessalonica? Just giving the, the big picture. Well, let's read about it in Acts 17, starting with verse 1. Paul and Silas traveled on through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica is named after who now? You know? This is named after Alexander the Great's sister. <laughs> so he's, he went from father's town to sister's yeah. town. Okay? And he found there a synagogue. Remember the, the rules were that if there were at least 10 Jewish families in a city, they were supposed to, to have a synagogue. So there during three Sabbaths, that would be three weeks, he held discussion with the people, quoting and explaining the scriptures and proving from them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. This Jesus whom I announce to you, Paul said, is the Messiah. Now, what had the Jews been waiting for for hundreds of years? The Messiah. The Messiah. Some of them were convinced and joined Paul and Silas, but so did many of the leading women and a large group of Greeks who worshiped God. Now, why do you suppose the leading women, what, who, would, who would those people be? They probably have money. Probably have money, wealthy people, leading citizens of the town. Mm -hmm. And who were these large group of Greeks who worship God? Greeks that worship God. <laughs> okay, but what does that mean? There were quite a number of people around the Mediterranean world who, for one reason or another, were attracted to the Jewish religion. But they weren't ready to go all the way and get circumcised and all this kind of stuff, but they attended the synagogue regularly. So they were called followers of the way, something like that. So these would be followers of the way. Well, Greeks kind of like good discussions, right? Yeah. And they, they probably had good discussions there. Yeah. Yes. By the way, Ken, back in verse uh, 3, mm -hmm. uh, 2 and 3, Paul's holding these discussions, quoting and explaining the scriptures, and proving from them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. What text did he use, and where did he get that we're, list of texts? We're going to discuss that a little bit later, so I'm going to ask you just to hold that question, because we're going to have a list of texts. I'll write text. it down over here. Yeah, okay. He won't let you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the Jews who weren't happy with what Paul was accomplishing, were jealous and gathered worthless loafers from the streets and formed a mob. These were homeless people probably, or maybe just loafers that hung around the marketplace, and they just gathered them up and says, you know, we've got to get rid of these people. They set the whole city in an uproar and attacked the home of a man named Jason, called Jason in an attempt to find Paul and Silas and bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city authorities and shouted, these men have caused trouble everywhere. Now they have come to our city, and Jason has kept them in his house. They are all breaking the laws of the emperor, saying that there is another king whose name is Jesus. With these words, they threw the crowd and the city authorities into an uproar. The authorities made Jason and the others pay the required amount of money to be released and then let them go. The money they were required to, to put up was probably some kind of a bond to say, we will not cause any more disturbances. Something like that. Well, as a result, Paul was only able to stay in Thessalonica for maybe four weeks or maximum five weeks, a short period of time. He's only actually preached in the synagogue for three weeks, and now he's out again. And so, where did he go next? Berea. Berea, a small town, Berea. Um, Paul escaped to Berea, but was forced to leave Berea because the group from Thessalonica came to hunt him down there. He then went with some friends to Athens. He asked for Timothy and Silas to join him in Athens as soon as possible. So, what do we have? What, have hap what happens? Well, as soon as Timothy arrives, arrives in Athens, Paul presents his concern for the Thessalonians. He said, those poor people have a really tough time. I mean, I was only there for three weeks, by the way, what do you suppose Paul did during those three weeks? Suppose he had an evangelistic series with tent meetings every night? 
jury didn't stay quiet, that's for sure. Yeah. I bet you he met in homes of people that probably most of the day and into the night every day. So they, these people had more than just a superficial introduction to the gospel. They, Paul had spent quite a bit of time with them. Well, um, Paul was worried that they still didn't have adequate root, rooting in the gospel. So he asked Timothy to go back to Thessalonica as quickly as possible and see how they were doing. And evidence for that is, is found in 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, Finally, we could not bear it any longer, so we decided to stay on alone in Athens while we sent Timothy, our brother who works with us for God in preaching the good news about Christ. We sent him to strengthen you and help your faith so that none of you should turn back because of these persecutions. You yourselves know that such persecutions are a part of God's will for us and, 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 and so forth. So here's the first letter to the Thessalonians. Um, Paul prepares it. He's very worried about what's going on back there in, in Athens, so he sends Timothy back. And what was the result? Well, let me read one other verse. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.17. As for us, brothers and sisters, when we were separated from you for a little while, not in our thoughts, of course, but only in body, how we missed you and how hard we tried to see you again. So he's just trying to express in this letter how, 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 much, how strongly he felt for his friends le left there in Thessalonica. So what, did, what, what information did Timothy come back with? Mm -hmm. Well, he came back with the information, well, some very good news. Uh, the affection of the Thessalonians for Paul was as strong as ever, and they were still standing fast in their faith. Look at a couple of passages. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 Our brothers and sisters, the same thing happened to you that happened to the churches of God in Judea, to the people there who belonged to Christ. You suffered the same persecutions from which your own people that you, from your own people that they suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. How displeasing they are to God! How hostile they are to everyone! They even try to stop us from preaching to the Gentiles the message that would bring them salvation. In this way, they had brought to completion all the sins they had all, they have always committed, and now God's anger has at last come down on them. So, what's Paul trying to say here? Are you the first people who ever got persecuted for the gospel? Certainly not. The Jews have been persecuted. The Christian Jews have been persecuted. Others have been persecuted. Look at another passage. Here would be chapter 3, verses 46. While we were still with you, we told you beforehand that we were going to be persecuted. And as you well know, that is exactly what happened. That is why I had to send Timothy. I could not bear it any longer, so I sent him to find out about your faith. Surely it could not be that the devil had tempted you, and all our work had been for nothing. What kind of persecution do you think they were having? Well, clearly I mean, back in... It could be anything from... Persecution is anything from ridicule from your yeah. neighbors, clear up to somebody gumming out with a gun after you. Yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. So. Yeah. Do you think it was really bad, or is it just... Pretty serious, sounds pretty like. serious? Did Paul could still call them. His glory and his joy. But there were other things that worried Paul. And now look at this. But this is from the Daily Study Bible. I thought they, they summarized it quite nicely. The preaching of the second coming had produced an unhealthy situation in which people had stopped working and had abandoned all ordinary pursuits to await the second coming with a kind of hysterical expectancy. So Paul tells them to be quiet and to get on with their work. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 they were worried about what was to happen to those who died before the second coming arrived. Now, you wonder about this. He'd only been gone from them for a few weeks, and apparently some of their people had already died. Did they die because of the persecution? We don't know. Well, how long was it? Just a matter of weeks. A few weeks. Maybe they were just thinking, well, maybe some key people had died since Paul had been there. Well, but I mean, it, 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 relatively natural. few people would have become Christians. I mean, it, there was a group, but I mean, it's not a huge group. And some of them dying incidentally in, in a period of three or four weeks, that would be surprising. Well, there was a tendency to despise all lawful authority. The argumentative Greek has always, was always in danger of producing a democracy run mad, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 14. 
There was the ever-present danger that they would relapse into immorality. It was hard to unlearn the point of view of generations and to escape the contagion of the heathen world. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. There was at least a section who slandered Paul. They hinted that he preached the gospel for what he could get out of it. 1 Thessalonians 2, 5 and 9. And that he was something of a dictator. 1 Thessalonians 2, 6, 7 and 11. There was a certain amount of division in the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 5, 13. So these were the things that Paul felt he needed to address. Already this brand new church that had just been started up by him, he's only spent a short time with them, and now he's concerned about their divisions, about, you know, uh, trying things running amok, people dividing in the church. How would you deal with those kind of issues? Could Paul go back there? What do you think would have happened if yeah. Paul had gone back to Thessalonica? Might have been the end of his ministry. Might have been the end of his if ministry. They would have if persecuted. If the persecution was that great for those people, what would they have done to Paul? Yeah. Well, it's an unreal consideration anyway because he didn't, did he? No, he didn't. Mm. So, well, unfortunately, having read Paul's first letter to them, the Thessalonians apparently got the idea that Jesus would come back very soon. Some of them decided to stop working. So Paul needed to write a second shorter letter to assure them that they would, there would be some delay. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 12. Of course, Paul repeated some of his teachings from 1 Thessalonians, but in his second letter he was warning them about the belief that Jesus would come very soon. I would like to just get our thinking in the way of Thessalonians here by reading you the introduction to these two small books in the Message Bible. The way we perceive the future sculpts the present, gives contour and tone to nearly every action and thought through the day. If our sense of future is weak, we live listlessly. Much emotional and mental illness and most suicides occur among men and women who feel that they have no future. The Christian faith has always been characterized by a strong and focused sense of future, with belief in the second coming of Jesus as the most distinctive detail in that future. From the day Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers lived in expectancy of his return. He told them he was coming back. They believed he was coming back. They continued to believe it. For Christians, it is the most important thing to know and believe about the future. The practical effect of this belief is to charge each moment of the present with hope. For, any, for if the future is dominated by the coming again of Jesus, there is little room left on the screen for projecting our anxieties and fantasies. It takes the clutter out of our lives. We're far more free to respond spontaneously to the freedom of God. All the same, the belief can be misconceived so that it results in paralyzing fear for some. Well, am I going to be ready? When will Jesus come back? Or shiftless indolence and others. Well, all we have to do is just sit here and wait for him to come back, right? Paul's two letters to the Christians in Thessalonica, among much else, correct such depilitating misconceptions, prodding us to continue to live forward in taut and joyful expectation for what God will do next in Jesus. Okay. So now we have a little bit of background. So have this you, is this kind of thing has happened before. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been people setting times when God, when Jesus would come, and Many they do the them. same thing. They just kind of throw, sell everything, and just kind of wait for him. Mm -hmm. And then Paul has given counsel that you shouldn't do that. Yes. So it looks like even if the Lord's coming is imminent that verse is still going to be there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we, we must so, take this verse alone and say, okay, I can stop working. I'll, I'll sit around and wait until he shows up. We can't take it alone. Well, it, it says not to do that. But, um, but possibly will there be a point where you just know the Lord's going to come any time and um, that you would, well, I know would you actually know, do that? The Lord's going to come sometime. Okay, but it looks like there would never be a point where you would quit planning for the future, right? Mm -hmm. 
It seems uh, like that's what Paul tells us. Keep working. Keep working. Keep. Don't sell everything and get yourself Some, into a, a position that when the winter comes, you're going to freeze to death. Some you know. people say, quote the scripture which says, occupy till I come. Okay. As I recall, in 1844, fall of 1844, the Adventists of the time were so convinced that Jesus was coming that they left their crops in the ground, mm -hmm. didn't harvest their crops, and uh, they had problems after that when Jesus didn't yeah. come on October 22, I think it was. 1844, that's right. They believed he was come, going to come. Well, somehow, Paul, here's where I think we're getting, we, we've did a lot of background stuff, and we'll, we'll get into more background too, but somehow, and I want you to really think about this, somehow Paul managed to convince people in a number of cities and under a number of different situations, different kinds of circumstances, to believe in the gospel. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is what a culprit would call cold calling. You just walk up and knock on somebody's door. How do you convince those people in a relatively short period of time that this message is so important it's worth dying for? I mean, think about it. Well, don't you think there was some other evidences around that they may have, may have heard before okay. he came? What, what would that be? Well, like Jews take trips to Jerusalem during the Passover time, and that's about when, when Jesus had his you know, crucifixion, and a lot of people knew about it and actually saw it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that this all went all over the place. So there's one possibility. There may have actually been some people in Thessalonica or in Philippi or maybe over in Rome where Paul hopes to be headed pretty soon it that had actually like been in Jerusalem. How could you have one person come in and give you all this fantastic stuff and this new interpretation of the Bible and, uh, and just have everybody believe it? Well, There's that's got to be something that's there. My, that's my challenge. That's what I'm asking for. Because if there had been people with all this message about the marvelous things that happened in Jerusalem, you know, 15 years before that, you would have thought Paul would have mentioned that as, well, guess what? We found some people here who knew about this already. There's no mention of anything like that. Well, maybe it was so obvious he didn't write it down. Well, I mean, I, I can't rule that out. Yeah. But that was 15 years. That was more than 15 years, 18 years ago. And, and, and nothing great has happened yet. There's no, there's no Christian church there in these places. Possibly. they, Lots of people are probably were wondering what all this means. Yeah. You know, and nobody came and tried to explain it to them. And then well, somebody actually did. The bigger question for us today was how do, we, how do we establish that kind of confidence in people we talk to today? Well... First of all, Christianity is not really that um, people aren't completely ignorant about it. They know about okay. God. They know about Christians. They know about this, that, and the other thing. They probably wonder why people are Christians. And um, so it's not like cold turkey going to somebody and saying, you so know. It should be easier for us. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I'm just, I'm just saying that it isn't coming out of nowhere with something completely that you haven't heard of before. Do you, do, do you feel that it's easy to convince people that something written in a book 2,000 years ago is still really important for their lives today? Well, we, they know the book is around. Yes. They know that it's a, the best-selling book and has been for a long some, time. Some of them probably there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that like it, and maybe other people don't understand why. So there, there is well, some background here somewhere. Okay, we as Seventh-day Adventists, as this is a Seventh-day Adventist program, although we're more than welcome to encourage any of our friends, Christian friends, to join us in studying the Bible, we have these words from Ellen White that would, might set up a, some suggestions. God, we, well, she says we must, ne we must always use solid evidence to convince people. God never, never, asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word, that would be the Bible, right? And are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. So he's saying none of this just 
uh, emotional appeals and that kind of stuff. We, we, we don't, we're not against emotional appeals, but what you have to say, it better be solidly based on Scripture. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Steps to Christ, page 105, paragraph 2. So what about it? Paul apparently convinced the Thessalonians that the, li the, that the life and death of Jesus was a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament and that the second coming of Jesus was a certainty. How did he go out doing that? Do, do you feel that you can go speak to your scientific friends, for example, and convince them that, oh, the second coming of Jesus is a certainty? Scientific friends, that's, that kind of I'm, throws I'm, a wrench in the... I'm, I'm, makes I'm, it very complicated. I, I, okay, There's but a lot aren't of those things. the people who are supposed to accept solid evidence? Well... Yeah, but um, okay. even even solid evidence doesn't really make you that confident. I mean, there's a lot of theories out there that people are pretty confident with, but you could probably talk them out of it if there was other things happening. Um, so what am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the question still is the same. How did Paul, in a relatively short period of time, convince these people so persuasively that some of them were ready to go. I mean, one of these members that was converted here in Thessalonica went to prison with Paul in Rome a little while later, a few years later. But You know, a lot of people are going to say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, come on, it was the Holy Spirit. All right? Okay. Um, that's Spirit, true. Not, not but, working today? But... Um, Remember, I, I kind of remember back when, when Graham Maxwell had his Sabbath school class. Remember, he'd go around and around. How do you know that it's the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. How do you know that it isn't really Satan's spirit? And you'd have all these answers. And, and yeah. But what if this and that and the other thing happens and everybody kind of back off? Mm -hmm. And um, Well, we know that at the end of time, Satan himself is going to appear as Christ claiming that he's there to lead the world to a time of peace, etc., etc., performing miracles, healing people, etc. How are we going to stand up when that happens? Revelation 13 says the whole world is going to wander after him. The whole world. And except, it finally mentions, except for a little remnant over here. So, this is worrisome, friends. Well, what do you think Paul said? When you read Paul's, Paul's letters, he always talks about the gospel. He was absolutely convinced of the gospel. Certainly you would get that impression. You read the first 10 verses or so of, of uh, the book of Galatians. You would also get that from reading Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. What, what do we learn about Paul's basic understanding of the gospel? He certainly was sure about it, wasn't he? He talks about repentance, forgiveness, acceptance by God, or you know, acceptance of God, and then final transformation. Um, and all of this is supposed to lead to salvation, which means what? Healing. Healing. So isn't, this isn't just... Uh, a theoretical, legal, forensic kind of thing, this is supposed to be a real change. Healing is a real change, right? In people's lives. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are you leading up to? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get some ideas about what Paul might have said. What he might have said. Yeah. Do you think that uh, there was any healing happening? Like He says so. Salvation. It's funny, it's funny that he doesn't mention it too much. Well, he talks about salvation. Salvation is healing. Right, but I'm talking about like what Jesus did. Oh, yeah. Or even even what uh, Peter did after Jesus was gone. He, mm -hmm. they, they healed a lot of people. Well, Paul did some. You know, he, the, later on, a young man, they were, Paul was talking to a group up on the third floor of a building, and a young man was sitting in the, in the window seal and fell out and killed himself on the 
the ground down below and Paul went around and raised him back to life again, took him back up and went on to the sermon. So, so was there a, a lot of demonstration like that? or I don't know. It doesn't say anything about that in, in either Philippi or Thessalonica. We just don't know. You would think with all the stories that parables and things that Christ gave and they're all recorded mm -hmm. and we've got a lot of writing from Paul here that there would be something if that was to be the message for aspect. us. Mm -hmm. Of course this was written long before the Gospels. Yes. I, I'm not comparing it with the Gospels. I'm just comparing it in that um, the message that God wanted from yeah. Paul was different than what's mm -hmm. in the Gospels. Well, if you had an opportunity to speak to all your neighbors, let's say, or people in a certain town here, you've marched into a certain town, let's just suppose that they know very little about Christianity. What would you want to say to them? What, what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. How about trying to find out what they've heard? And that's an excellent See. point. The first thing you want to know is, where are yeah, they? Thank you, no. What are they thinking? What, what is their background? Do they know anything about the gospel? Do they know anything about Christianity? What's their religious background? You want to know all those things. Yeah, very good. And do they have misconceptions about mm -hmm. the gospel? Yeah. Or you might even ask them, say, what, what you've been told. Now, does that make sense to you? Do you like that? Or do, are you f turned off by it? And then play off of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we would, we would suggest, those of us who believe in the larger view, um, approach the, the great controversy and, and, and so forth, that the best and most important good news of all is that God is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be. You know, if, if as Satan has claimed, that God is arbitrary, vengeful, exacting, unforgiving, and severe, none of us would want to live with him. At least I hope we would. But even though we were still sinners, God's work of redemption was accomplished through the life and death of Jesus Christ. We do not need to do anything to improve on what God did. We can't do anything to improve on what God did. We just need to accept the fact that we are sinners and only God can do anything about it. So what does God need to do to deal with our sins? Well, it's, it sounds like it sounds like what you're alluding to is that maybe Paul came in and said that I have a better God. Well, and, and explain why this is better. Maybe he said, what if you had a God that did this? Mm -hmm. What if you had a God that did that? Um, wouldn't that be better? And believe it or not, things happen to point to that kind of God. Mm -hmm. So that could be one one way you could do it. Yes. Well, and that's kind of what you're saying, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because well, it, look, at, just look at Acts 17, 1 to 3 to get a little idea. We looked at this a moment ago. Paul and Silas traveled on to Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. Why would he go there first? Well, they're going to meet the people that have similar background and um, okay. thinking. Okay, he knew that if, if he was going to have any impact on the Jewish community at all, he would have to go to them first. Because as soon as he started preaching to the Gentiles, what would the Jews say? You know, yes, get out of here, yeah. leave us alone. So he has to go to the Jews first. So that's what he does. He goes to the synagogue and he preaches to them three Sabbaths in a row. Now, fortunately for Paul... Um, <coughs> If a scholar arrived in a city or a town where there was a synagogue, and especially if he had any experience back in Jerusalem, in other words, he had been to the big headquarters, he was often asked to read from the scriptures and to comment, right there in church. That fit perfectly with Paul's approach. So what would he do? He would begin by pointing out portions from, which, from what we know as the Old Testament regarding the coming Messiah. No doubt he would use a number of passages from the Old Testament. Maybe he'd be... Had. Yeah, I mean, I mean, outside of yeah. uh, gr other Greek writings, or, yeah. or but that's that's was his textbook. Yeah, he may have begun with Genesis three fifteen. You can't go back much further than that, and probably ended with Isaiah fifty three. That would be a great place to stop and, and make an appeal. 
The Jews who were well informed must have understood that there were two trains of thought in the Old Testament. One train focused on the fact that the coming Messiah would establish a kingdom and rule forever. The other train of thought focused on the fact that the Messiah would be a suffering servant. And of course, that's the main uh, focus of several passages in the book of Isaiah. The Jews were not quite sure how to put these two collection of ideas together. And of course, they preferred the idea that he would come and conquer the world. Then Paul would focus on showing how the life of Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now, I haven't forgotten your question, Gordon. We're, uh, we're going to look at so this. So where did this model come from? Where did that model come from? Yeah. Well, it's likely that this is exactly what Jesus did when speaking to the two men on the road to Emmaus on Resurrection Sunday. And there they are, and Jesus took them through the Old Testament and showed them da-da-da. And these people, you can see their eyes, was probably getting bigger and bigger. Said, wow, we didn't think about that. We didn't think about that. We didn't think about that. And then, of course, you know, we, we don't know whether they were just uh, so in, enraptured by what he had to say that they didn't pay too much attention to him, him personally, or whether God intentionally kept them from recognizing him until, of course, he got to the house and he raised his hand to bless the food, and they recognized him and... He was gone. And what did they do then? They rushed back to Jerusalem as fast as they go in the dark now. Fast as they could go. And they got to the upper room and knocked on the door. And they had to be, you know, identify themselves. And then they quite carefully opened the door and let them two in. And who else came in at the same time? Jesus. And there he told them, Look, I'm risen. I Here I am. Touch me. Feel me if you need to. Did he close the door? For, did they close the door first, and then he appear, or did he go in uh, well, when the door was open? Probably they closed the door because they're still pretty worried about the Roman, the you Jewish get to authorities. First Corinthians fifteen: the yeah. spiritual body you have to die of physical body and be raised back a spiritual body, and yeah. we use that story to uh, kind of describe what goes on. Well, where would you go in the Old Testament to try to prove that the Messiah was going to come? suffer, die, rise to, from the dead, and come again. Well, you can't prove that from the Old Testament, all of that. But there are in some interesting examples of people in the Old Testament who went through very difficult times before rising to positions of strength and power. I mean, <coughs> think about uh, Joseph who was in prison for several years. Moses was out there in exile for 40 years. David was in exile for a number of years, running away from Saul. And Daniel. Think of all he went through before finally he became, he rose to become prime minister. So, what do you suppose was the attitude of this church in Thessalonica when they heard Paul's message? Now we're talking about uh, I shouldn't have said church. I really probably should have said synagogue. We're talking about primarily Jews now. But although there, we've already mentioned that there were a lot of Jew, a lot of others, Greeks, who were attracted by the Jewish religion and, and would have been attending the synagogue. You know, it's, it, it's just kind of hard to know what everybody was thinking back then to be mm -hmm. able to line up something mm -hmm. or some approach because um, like I said I don't know how much they knew about Jesus how much mm -hmm. rumor was going around about Jesus about this man that went around healing mm -hmm. and then got crucified and um, and some believed that he was the Messiah and some some didn't and and um, so you know it's kind of hard to know that background mm -hmm. you know what kind of setting as far as their thought goes on that. It's, it's a little difficult for me. Mm -hmm. Well, this background stuff is, you know, we can, we can talk a little bit about the historical background, but to know exactly what Paul did, of course, we, we, we only have the information. Well, it's not just not the, just the historical background of what actually happened. It's, a, it's what the people knew when he came in to start talking to them. Yeah. Whether they were completely ignorant of it or they knew something, mm -hmm. And or even were to the point that they were asking questions about it, you know, and well, they were they were actually open to have somebody come in, 
give their their uh, ideas about it, you know, especially if they came from Jerusalem. To to get an idea about what kind of I mean, one way to get an idea about how Paul's thoughts and his comments and his teachings went over, we we can look at the the people who responded. What did we learn about the people who responded to Paul's preaching? Some leading women. What would cause leading women to be attracted to what Paul had to say? And Greeks who worshipped God, these would not be people who were afraid of, of going against the crowds. These people were willing to think for themselves, right? Sure. Yeah. To leave the Roman pantheon and come over here and worship with these Jews? You know, you have to be a think, you have a serious thinker for yourself. Um, they have it, to be the type of per people that will actually change their lives based yeah. on new truth. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's only a few people that will do that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to notice that two of the people who became Christians under the instruction from Paul were Aristarchus, who became a fellow prisoner of his at a later time, and Jason, who apparently had a large house where the church met. You can read about that in Colossians 4, 10 and 11, and Acts 17, 49. By the way, for those of you who might be interested, um, these handouts will be available on our, on our website, theox.org, theox, or theologicalcrossroads.org, uh, and you can look at all this material yourself. In any case, it seems clear that the church that was finally established in Thessalonica was largely Gentile. Once again, we were reminded that the gospel is supposed to reach out to everyone, rich and poor, Jews and Greeks, even what the, Jew, what the Greeks would call barbarians. What's a barbarian? Someone who didn't speak Greek. Someone who didn't speak Greek, because all those other people sounded like they were just saying, bar, 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 bar. And that's where the word barbarian comes from. Well, what about, our, about us today? Is our message to be presented before the whole world? Well, Ellen White says this in her books, The Acts of the Apostles, from Paul's day to the present time, God, by his Holy Spirit, has been calling after the Jew as well as the Gentile. There is no respect of persons with God. So Paul is reaching out to all kinds of people, and he apparently drew in people from a large variety of backgrounds. Uh, the apostle regarded himself as a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians as well as to the Jews, but he never lost sight of the decided advantages possessed by the Jews over others, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And of course, that's quoted in Romans 3, the first few verses there. The gospel, he declared, is the power of God unto salvation or healing to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 380. So, Gordon, your question. Have you ever wondered what text from the Old Testament Paul and others might have used to support the idea of a suffering Messiah? Consider the following. Now, we don't have time to look at all these, but let me just pick a few. Start out with Genesis 3.15. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Now, this is right after Eve and Adam have committed sin in the Garden of Eden. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head. Now, God is speaking to whom? The serpent. To the serpent. Her offspring will crush her head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. Does that sound like the church is going to have an easy time of it? No, bite, being bitten by a snake on the heel isn't fun. Okay? Look at Genesis twenty-two eighteen. 18. All the nations will ask me to bless them as I have blessed your descendants, all because you obeyed my command. So there's some good things uh, promised to the descendants of Abraham. Look at uh, Genesis 49.10. Judah will hold the royal scepter and his descendants will always rule. Nations will bring him tribute and bow in obedience before him. That sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Well, let's pick a few other, for other spots further along. Look at um, Isaiah 53. The people reply, who would have believed what we now report? Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw, him, draw us to him. 
We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne, all the while we thought that his suffering was the punishment sent by God. But because of our sins, he was wounded, be beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment that he, he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment that all of us deserved. So, and of course, there's prophecies that predict where Jesus is going to be, where the Messiah is going to be born, etc. And all these prophecies fit who? Jesus. Jesus. So, Ellen White, once again, in his closing proclamation of the gospel, when special work is to be done for classes of people hitherto neglected, God expects his messengers to take particular interest in the Jewish people, whom they find in all parts of the earth. As they see the Christ of the gospel dispensation portrayed in the pages of the Old Testament scriptures and perceive how clearly the New Testament explains the Old, their slumbering faculties will be aroused and they will recognize Christ as the Savior of the world. Many will by faith receive Christ as their Redeemer. Again, Acts of the Apostles, page 381. Do you think the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament could be used in approaching Jews in our day? Yes. What about approaching even secular Jews? What kind of approaches should or could be used for secular people of almost any kind? I mean, to try to walk up to someone with a, with a typical college or university training and say, here, I want to convince you that you should believe in the Bible, and our, and our situation doesn't sound like an easy task, right? If they're well off financially and economically and health-wise, mm -hmm. pretty tough to break down the barrier. Well, there's a lot more things we need to talk about, but it seems clear that Paul was successful in his approach to these people. He clearly had a message which, had, which resounded with them, and they were ready to follow him even into prison, as in the example of Aristarchus. So as we study through the rest of Thessalonians here, uh, keep that in mind and think what you would have done if Paul had preached to you. See you next week. Thank you.